Okay, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Which says this. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, <clears throat> endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. For unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being f- past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away, putting away, lying, speak every man truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labour, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour, and evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. What a chapter. What a chapter. If we all obeyed that in word, in everything, there'd be a different church even today. We're picking up from verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt... According to the deceitful lusts, we're picking up from there this morning. The old man. <laughs> Some people say, oh, well, the old man. <laughs> that's, that's the ladies. My wife talks like that. The old man. Talk, <laughs> talking about me. The old man. No, she doesn't really. Um, I know some of you. I don't know all of you. I know some of you to a degree. And uh, I know you from you being a Christian. You've come to the church. What you're like, your characters, your person. Um, you know, and, and I make judgments on you like you make judgments on me, you know, whether you like me or don't like me and m- myself the same. You know, we can all 
have our good points and our bad points. And I didn't know any of you, as far as I know, before you were saved. What kind of person you were like then? Have you changed? I hope so. And it's quite amazing the different, well, the the changes that we have in our lives. You didn't know me before I was saved. I was saved at 18, I'm 48 now. It's quite incredible. 30 years I've had as a Christian. You've only seen me as a Christian, a good little boy. I joke. Um, it's going to be a tough one this morning. <laughs> but beforehand, some of us lived wild lives. Yeah? We're not going to mention anything. We're not going to bring it up. We don't need to, but some of us were wild. I'm not going to pick on anybody this morning or mention names, so you can keep looking down because I'm not going to have eye contact with you. But um, the old man, you know, your old person, what you were like, you would surprise us, and I would surprise you in the things that we've done. I was talking with um, someone yesterday, and um, we were talking about uh, just touching on you know what we've come from, and and it's quite amazing where this person has come from, what they've done. You wouldn't recognise them, and now they're a Christian. It's fantastic. The, the the change in us. Thank God that we've changed. Thank God that we're saved. It is amazing. You know, I've. I've got lots of regrets, like you, you know, they talk about, you know, things you've done in the past. Listen, there's certain things in the past that are going to dog us till the rapture, right? It's just going to, you know, it just the devil loves doing things like that, throwing the negative stuff at us. You know, there's all this kind of stuff, but listen, I, I can't live in the past. It's very interesting that um, people who aren't saved, people who aren't Christians, a lot of them, especially the older folk, they live in the past. My dad's a classic example. He's 80, coming up to 86. He's got nothing to look forward to. He's an atheist, a hardened atheist. He's got nothing to look forward to. He's waiting to die. He had a fall yesterday. That shocked him. And do you know what? It's really, uh, we've said this before, we were talking this about on Friday, how you think differently as a child, differently as a teenager, differently in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and then you start thinking differently when you hit your 50s, 60s, 70s. And you, we, it's the Lord how he, he develops and changes your mind, you know, and, and things like this. And uh, the way my dad thinks now, it's very interesting. You see him as an 80 year old man who's waiting to die with no hope. It's tragic, it's sad. Heartbreaking, being honest with you. And there's millions like him. But for you, you know, we live for today. The rapture could happen today. Fantastic. I could be the Lord today. Hear my name called and bang, I'm gone. Fantastic. I've got a lot of hope. I've got some great things happened in the past, but I don't sort of dwell and live there. I live for today. I don't make big plans. I'm not one of these that plans, as most of you know. If I think something, I do it. I'm not, um, and that's good and bad. I mean, I'm not one for DIY, yeah? I hate it, being honest with you. I'm not into all that kind of stuff. I'd rather pay somebody to do the job. And I'm not very good at stuff, you know. The worst thing anybody could say to me, especially my wife, could you put up a shelf? Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> You're joking, aren't you? And I'm useless at that. So we, we've got, i just give you the example, we've got little coffee tables that we bought for 20 quid in a second-hand shop, and it was brilliant. It worked brilliant. You could stand an elephant on it. It's a real good, solid thing. Yeah, but it's scratched to bits, and I thought, well, it's getting a bit worn now. I'll go, I'll go get some... Um, I know nothing about painting or anything. In fact, this was, I didn't tell you this story. I forgot to tell you this. So I go down to the local DIY. I didn't even want to go across town. Just go to a local one. So I go into this thing, and I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. Not a clue. I know nothing about paintbrushes. I know nothing about paint. I know nothing about doing second up furniture up. So I go, and there's a guy there, and he's looking a bit confused. And um, he's standing there looking at the paints. And I'm thinking, if he's looking confused, I'm going to be even worse. I said, do you know anything about painting? And he goes, not much, not much, mate. And I said, well, good, that's two of us. I said, have you any... And I told him my thing. I've got to paint this thing. He said, well, if I was you, I'd sand it down. I said, that's a big help. I said, no, I said, I'm looking for a botched job. I said, I'm not looking for... I don't want to spend hours doing this table. Like I've only paid 20 quid for it. And he said, well, I just slap the paint on it then, mate. I thought, that's a good idea, yeah. So so I've got this thing and... and, and I don't take it outside, I ain't got the time to take the, the thing outside, so I just put a few newspapers around the lounge, yeah, hoping, it's not even our house, we rent it, on a, on a cream carpet, and I'm dreading this as well, and I'm thinking, Lord, just help me not to drop this, the missus will go mad, then the landlord will go mad, so I'm painting this table, and it's come up, it looks really good, and I'm thinking, and I walk past it now, and think, man, thank you, Lord, you've done a good job. we all got hidden talents. You're joking, you're joking, ain't you? Look at this, this is the old man. You don't know what I was like, I don't know what you're like, but this is interesting. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. I wonder what you were like, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. You know, you've put off the old man, and you've put on the new man, we're going to talk about that this morning. The old man, which is corrupt. Corrupt. Now, words are interesting, I didn't do very well at school. I should have done better. I should have tried harder. 
And we have regrets on that as well. I enjoyed sport too much. And chasing girls. <laughs> I enjoy chasing girls more than sport. <laughs> I joke, I joke. <laughs> and um, I look back and I think, I wish I'd have done more on English. You know, since becoming a Christian all those years ago, read, the first book I ever read was Daisy the Cow. I saw I was 28. No, I'm joking. Here. And then the second, the second book I ever read was the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. That's the first two books I ever read. Daisy the Cow and then the Bible. It's amazing you've, you've remembered that. You like to mock me, don't you? Um, mine eye. She's very good. The King James Bible believing little child. Lovely. She's our top student in the class. Um, corrupt. Corrupt. This is an interesting word. Tell me if you are any of these. You shouldn't be, because we've put off the old man, we've put on the new man. But tell me if you're any of these. For words that are associated. You know, they say synonyms and all this kind of stuff. Well, bless you. Here we go. Corrupt, right? Dishonest. Are you dishonest? In any of your dealings. You're Christians. You're an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you dishonest? In anything you do, in your business, the way you talk to people, the way you come across, your family members, are you dishonest? You know, this is going to sound crazy, but sometimes you have to lie. Think about it. Or do you? Dishonourable, are you? Unscrupulous. There's a word. Unscrupulous. Do you know what it means? Unprincipled. What are your principles like? Your morals, your standards. It's very interesting is that um, what you're passionate for, what you like what you stand for, you will try and justify yourselves. If you're not, you know, if you want to do something, you'll do it. It's like Christians that want to drink alcohol. They'll find a verse to drink alcohol. But the Bible says, (laughs) we were looking at this yesterday, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. (laughs) They'll justify it, to drink alcohol. You will bend and twist the scriptures to justify why you want to do something. Because you're all a bunch of hypocrites, and I'm the worst. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, your final authority should be this book. Should be. And you're all super spiritual when you come to church. My final authority, I'm a King James Bible-believing Christian. And my final authority is the Word of God. I'm dispensational, premillennial, and my final authority is the Word of God. But your final authority, in reality, is you. You choose what you want to do. I wonder how many of you got up early this morning and read the scriptures, because it's your final authority. Maybe some of you did. Excellent if you did. I wonder how many of you spend as much time in this book as you do for your spiritual food, as you do for your physical food. You make time to eat. I make time to eat. You make time for the things you want to do. Your sport, your interest in, you know, your interests... Out of work, secular work, the things you do, your hobbies. You make time for the things you want to do. What's easier, to pick up the newspaper or pick up the, uh, or get on your iPhone these days or read the word of God? You're battling against the flesh all the time. This flesh is lazy. Unprincipled in regard to corrupt. I'm just looking at the word corrupt a second before we hit the new man and the old man. Immoral. That's an interesting word. Untrustworthy. Are you untrusted? Can you be trusted? You know you think you can trust people and then something happens and you, th- you lose all faith in them. That's why, listen, I don't... Um, i said this many times. Be careful what you get attached to in life. Be careful where you put your faith and trust. I trust no one except Jesus Christ. I trust nothing except the Word of God. I trust my wife to a degree. I'm watching you. And she trusts me to a degree. But trusting you lot, <laughs> you're joking, <isn't> you? <laughs> um, <laughs> we can trust each other to a degree. Underhanded, are you? Deceitful. Double dealing. Disreputable. Discreditable. Shameful. Scandalous. This is all to do with the word corrupt. Bribable. There's an interesting one. <laughs> Can you be bribed with anything? Does money speak for you? Can you be bought? 
Do you compromise in your secular work? Two weeks ago, wasn't it, we looked at something where we were saying, who's let the Lord down this week? And we all raised our hands. Sad, isn't it? We all let the Lord down. The way you think, you don't want to think these things. I don't want to think things. I see something, I don't want to think of things. That's why, you, you know, the Bible talks about taking thought, every thought captive. You've got to fight. You're in this flesh, you're in this body of death we're going to read about in a second maybe. And you're fighting it all the time, daily. You're fighting this flesh. I hate it. And the words you say and what you do, your actions. And then when the pressure's on, you're at work. You know, and the, you, 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 there's peer pressure and there's pressure from around you and there's pressure from your bosses and there's pressure in your job and you're surrounded by all this pressure and then suddenly you compromise. You hate it, but you compromise. Are we all like that? Or is it just me? Viable. Viable and viable. Can you be bought? Fraudulent. There's another word. All these interesting words. Lawless, tricky, shady, dodgy, (laughs) hollow-hearted. What's your heart like? To act dishonestly for personal gain. Corrupt. To act dis- now listen, you think about, you know, we talk about the government and the politicians, all that. I don't get involved with all that stuff, but you know what's going on and this Brexit rubbish and all this stuff. You know, you're sick of it. Everybody's sick of it. I'm sick of the politics. I'm sick of that we haven't got any decent leaders in this country. I'm sick of it. And the councils and all the people that put their, you know, they chuck a cheap bit of paper through the door hoping to get a vote from you because they've filled a hole in <laughs> down the road. You know, you vote for us. We filled that hole in. The Conservatives did it, not Labour. Sick of them. To act dishonestly, dishonesty, dishonestly. It's easy for you to say. For personal gain. Decay, rotten, putrid. Yeah? Corrupt. Are you corrupt? It says, go back to this, verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation. Yeah, You shouldn't be like you were. You're different. You're a Christian now. You're trying to take a stand. Don't compromise. And listen, now your colours to the mask, wear your heart and your sleeve. Be honest. Be straight down the line. Tell it as it is. Don't bend the truth. Just tell it as it is. And it will be better for you in the long run. Listen, people won't like you for it. Your family will turn against you. Certain members will, because I can't hack it. But colleagues at work won't like you. But you're better, rather than keeping everything a secret and trying to play this nicey-nicey person, you tell it as it is, just wear it, and you won't do it. Straight away, if you go for a job, and I try and do this wherever I've gone now, and I've failed many times, you try and say, look, listen, I am a Christian. I'm a not just a practice, I'm a born-again, Bible-believing Christian. It may mean nothing to you, but I just want to tell you that from the outset. Some people have turned to me and said, what does that mean? Oh, well, there's an opportunity for you. Now I can tell you what it means. I've told you a story before, but um, I apologise to Liz because she's heard most of these stories. (laughs) She has a go at me in the mornings. But just bear with me, dear, bear with me. And um, I went to see a guy. He was the managing director, no, sorry, he was the general manager of um, a depot, and he was my new boss. And he'd heard that I was a Christian, and he's a so-called Catholic, yeah? And there he is with his big cigar smoking, sitting in the back of his chair, and uh, he calls me and he wants to see all the new pe- all the people there because he's new to the company. And he says to me, he says, I'm a Catholic. And he says, I've heard that you're a Christian. And somebody said that you're a committed Christian. What does that mean? What's the difference between us, a Catholic and a Christian? <laughs> now I've got the chance. What do I do? Just try and play it nicely. And I, I thought, no, let's just get it out. You know, let's just tell it as it is. I said, the difference is this. When I die, I go to heaven. When you die, you go to hell. <laughs> he couldn't believe it. He can, he, he's like... <coughs> <laughs> with his cigar, he just couldn't believe it. But I tell you what, that did me more good by telling him like that. Then straight away, when I had, when he wanted me to compromise on certain things, and he knew, he knew that I wouldn't do it. You know, your colours to mind. Listen, I've failed in other areas. I haven't done that all the time. You try, you try, you do your best, and sometimes you win, and sometimes you lose. But you keep getting up, and you keep fighting. Right? I don't want to be corrupt. I don't want to keep going back to the old man. But I'm in this body of death, this flesh, and it dogs me to the rapture. And I've got to keep fighting. I've got to keep beating it down. And we've said this before. What you feed 
the most becomes the strongest part. If you're feeding yourself spiritually, you spiritually become stronger. If you're feeding yourself the flesh and, you know, this, you walk in the spirit and so you not fulfill the lust of the flesh, if you're feeding the flesh, that becomes dominant in your life. It's easy. You sin, you know, it's, it's such a cliche, but it's so true. This book keeps you away from sin or sin keeps you away from the book. It's as simple as that. And the more you're in it, the more holy and sanctified and better Christian you'll be. But it's tough. Sometimes it's hard. It sounds crazy. Sometimes it's hard to open the Bible and get in there. So, go back to this again. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lust. Corrupt, morally depraved. And that's another thing. Contaminate, yeah? A backslider is no good. If you're backsliding today, you're causing yourself problems. You'll cause other people problems because it contaminates. It's like a disease, So get right with God. If you're not right with God this morning, get right with God this morning. Sort your life out. Make the right decisions from now on. If there's stuff in your life that you ought to dump, dump it. Be brutal. Go over the top. Be brutal with it. If you need to clean up your life, clean up your life. If you need to get rid of stuff, you know, I'm not one for hoarding. I can't stand all this hoarding stuff. I go to people's houses and they hoard. I'm thinking, give me ten minutes, I'll sort your house out for you. (laughs) Before Donna and I got married, she used to collect all these little trinkets and all these little um, ornaments, little cute things, where she's been all around the world, little Disney thing, and little this, and little that, and little, all these little things that, you know, her nan had bought her, her mother had bought her. And so we, we get married, and we we're going to move into the house, and I says, uh, what's all that lot? And she says, oh, this is, this is, oh, and they, I've never even heard about this stuff. She says, oh, and I've got a bottom drawer. I said, we've all got bottom drawers. <laughs> And I did, I'd never even heard of it. And so she opens this bottle and I said, all oh, that chance, I said, you ain't bringing that with us. I said, let's get one thing straight. Let's get one thing straight. Yeah? You bring it, you'll have to dust it, because I ain't touching it. So we dumped the lot. She come around to my way of thinking. It was either that or divorce the second day. But I'm open-minded. <laughs> it's a team. It's a team. Corrupt, morally, contaminate, pollute, spread, poison. Listen, if you're not living right, you'll affect those around you. Live right. Do what's right. And then it says, look, that you put off concern the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Deceitful, dishonest, yeah? Untruthful, lying, insincere. One thing I can't stand is fake humility. Don't bring it here. Attention seekers, don't bring it here. I'm not into that stuff. I can't hack it. I'm brutal with that. I hate it. And I lose a lot of people th- from this, yeah? Just tell it is. Let's be honest with one another. Open this honesty. I'll dump you and if I find fake humility. And say, Listen, people want to get close and that. You choose your own friends and I choose mine. I can't hack fake it. You lie to me once you're out. Simple as that. See ya. <laughs> I can't stand being lied to. You don't like being lied to. I'm like that in business. I dumped one person, and it cost me thousands. All because he lied to me once. Oh, he was begging to come back. Forget it. You lied to me once you're out. Listen, I know we mess up and we forgive. I understand that as well. And I say this with a little bit of tongue-in-cheek. Of course, we'd forgive as Christians. But don't lie to each other. Be open and honest. Just tell it as it is. Don't play a game. Don't make out you're somebody when you're not. You ought to live by Galatians 6.3. Read it. Someone read it out loud. Galatians 6.3. You ought to live by this verse. Out loud, anybody who's there. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. <laughs> Live by it. Don't play the game. Yeah? Be honest. The Lord had to get through to Peter, didn't he? Feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He's teaching him a lesson. Paul and Peter had a bust up. There was contentions among the disciples, the apostles. There was contentions among... There's going to be contentions in the church. Don't leave church because of a frosty atmosphere. Sort it out. We've had loads of people leave. Listen, listen, let's, let's overcome some of the faults and let's just be as honest as we possibly can with each other. The Lord sees through all of this. Don't be false, don't be insincere, don't be untrustworthy, don't be two-faced. Crafty, cunning, sly, hypocritical, acting. Go back to the verse. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt, corrupt, 
according to the deceitful lusts. Lusts. Now there's a word. Now, you're all passionate about certain things in life. You've all got your pet doctrines, you've all got your favourite authors and your favourite preachers. You're passionate about things. If I tread on your toes, you're going to yelp. You're going to stand. Well, I, I don't like that. I don't believe that. Yeah, it's a fair comment. We've all got, you know, it'd be boring if we were all the same. Imagine if we were all the same, like Denny. How boring would that be? Yeah? Hey? Imagine that. Imagine we were all the same colour. Black as the ace of spades, like Denny. Hey? Or white as chalk, like me. Hey? We want a bit of mixture. We like it. Yeah? South African, what a voice. Hey? What a voice. Hey? When they read the scripture, it's like art. <laughs> I love the South African voice. Met some good South Africans in my time. Done business with a couple of one guy, amazing bloke. We're all different. We all have our passions. We all have our different desires in life. You all crave for certain things in life. You're human beings. You're a body you're a tripartite being. You've got a body, you've got a soul, and you've got a spirit. What you feed dominates the flesh or the spirit you've all got longings and yearnings and you hunger and thirst after things isn't it funny i wonder if we would thirst and yearn after righteousness and true holiness and godliness do you desire those things what's your appetite for man like this is a sexual filled world this is a satanic world this is this is the stuff being thrown at you 24 7 it's gone ballistic now with sodomy and gender stuff and all that stuff is coming in it's mad the whole thing has gone ballistic the whole thing is imploding yeah and they're all thirsty and you can say you can do what you want you're master of your own destiny you're in control of your own body i can i can have an abortion if i, I can do what i want it's me it's all about me that's what the world's it's a crazy world unbelievable world since i was a child you know um, 48, and so I'm going back, you know, 30, 40 years. 40 years. In the last 40 years, and I can't believe I'm talking like this, um, but in the last 40 years, I have never known anything go so rancid rapidly as this world. It's just the society around us, the morals and the principles and what's going I would never have believed it if somebody had told me how bad it would have got in my lifetime. I would expect this hundreds of years to, to go on. And, and that's how bad it's got. Preceding the rapture, you know, it's, it's, we look for, people look for signs, I want a sign, I want to say, how do we know how close we are? Listen, when they start saying that sodomy is normal and teaching children, you know you're close to the end. When they talk about the, the church apostatized and, um, you know, and, the, and the, the church has shifted from its original principles and what it really believed once, you know we're, we're right close to the end. You haven't got much time left. Don't waste your time. Redeem the time. Start getting right with the Lord. Start getting your tracks out. Start living right. Start witnessing. Start being the person that God wants you to be. People say, uh, we should be like the Lord Jesus. I've never met anybody that's like the Lord Jesus. What a joke that is. They're full of these cliche things. Oh, he reminds me of the Lord Jesus Christ. There ain't none of you that reminds me of the Lord Jesus Christ. You bunch of sinners. And I'm the worst. None of us are like him. But let God... Let God work through for you to be the best person you possibly can and do what God calls you to do. If God, I've said this before, if God calls you to mow a lawn for the rest of your life, some old lady's lawn, and you do what God calls you to do, you'll get your reward. As much as anybody, much of these people that go around evangelizing, what God calls you to do, do it. Just do it. And you won't go wrong. Lusts. A lust for power. A lust for sinful things. What do you lust after? All because the old man is corrupt, that he put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt, according to deceitful lusts. Now, before we move on, turn to a few scriptures on this. There's, well, it's just you could talk all day on this word, it's amazing. Turn to start off with Genesis 6, yeah? Right at the start of the Bible, Genesis 6, yeah? Adam and Eve, then we hit Genesis 6, and we read this. Can you believe this? Verse 5. We're six chapters in. <laughs> six chapters in to the Bible. And God writes this. Verse 5. And God saw the wickedness of man. Man alive, we've only just started. Was great in the earth. And every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What's changed? From Genesis 6 to 2019, what has changed? I'll tell you what's changed. We've got a lot worse. 
And now we promote this stuff. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. We looked at the word imagination. That was an amazing study that was. And the Lord said, I will destroy man, man alive. We've just had creation. Now God, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, the creeping thing, the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God always has his man. Where you will fail, someone will pick up the baton. God will always have his man. You know, 7,000 have not bowed the knee to Baal. God always has his men and women. And where, if you fail, and we do, and you go off the rails, and you know that people have got saved in your life and people you've been in touch with, and suddenly they've just backslid and they've gone back. They've run back to the world like a dog returns to its vomit, can you believe? Some people just run back to the world. They think it's easy and they've just had enough. They can't take it. So it's a hard life. You know, living the Christian life is tough. It's tough. And some people can't hack the pressure and they just run away. Then somebody else will take the place. We're in the army of the Lord. God's always got his men. There's people that have inspired you and helped you throughout your life. And you should be doing the same. People have mentored you and you should mentor other people. You should be training people up, helping people and encouraging people. I don't know what you do with your life. You know, what, to think, I mean, you go for an interview and people are trying to find out about you in a short space of time. You're given an hour for the interview and they're trying to find out about you, trying to find how you tick, what you work, what your plans are, what you've done. They're trying to find out in a, in a, 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 a little snapshot of your life what you're like. Well, God, what's to work in your life? What are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your life? Christians, majority of Christians are just lazy. We should be doing a lot more. You know, there's like no urgency today. And it's, it's tragic. There's no urgency. And so you just live, you know, you get up, another day is gone. You live this day, and then suddenly you go to bed at night. Well, what have you achieved today? What have you done for the Lord today? What are you doing with your life? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations. Noah, Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. What a legacy. Wonder if you dropped dead today, what legacy would you leave behind? What would you be remembered for? It's interesting, isn't it? There's so much we could say on this. But what legacy, you know, what, what do your friends and family think about you? How are you described at work? How, what do people think about you? And what about your enemies? What do they think about you? I watched a sermon last night. Um, and uh, it was Rockman on the bottle. I didn't realise three people in this in his family were chronic alcoholics. It's probably the most touching sermon you've ever heard. And I know that enemies have watched this who hate him and said they were moved to tears on this. You don't, you know, unless you've been there, you don't know what it's like to be an alcoholic, a drug addict. To come from that environment, be brought up with nothing. He gave one illustration where one guy, um, his child had died. He was, in his, he was on his deathbed, it died, and he stole the shoes off it just to buy some drugs. Do you know what it's like to be that low? Have any of you got that low? We live in this, you know, this <laughs> fantasy world sometimes. Where have you come from? The old man, what are you like? These are the generation, Noah, Noah was a just man, perfect in generation. Noah walked with God. Are you walking with God or are you walking against God? Are you fighting against God? Are you backsliding? Where are you this morning? Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth. The earth, here we go. The earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. It could be England. <laughs> England is filled with violence. You've got knife crime. Kids stabbing each other. What's all that about? Listen, you, you only hear about the certain ones. I heard that there's five stabbings a day in London alone. A day. England. Christian England. Five. What about Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool? What about all the other cities? Knife crime. It's gone ballistic. Kids are carrying knives. What's that about? They're emulating stuff. And they, uh, mine eye... 
affecteth mine heart. What you see affects your heart. That's why I try and instill into the young folk. Mine eye affecteth mine heart. Hundred pounds if you can tell me where the verse is. Thank you, I've saved it. Um, <laughs> mine eye affect, and don't you learn it for next week either. <laughs> Catch me off guard. Mine eye affected my heart. What you look at affects your heart. You look at all these music videos and rap music and all this sexual stuff, you'll become like it. You're feeding your flesh. Kids going around violence, they want Lamborghinis and they want girls and all the lads getting into rap and big chains and jeans that don't fit. <laughs> Don't look at mine on the way out, will you? <laughs> We're mad. What a mad world we live in. God looked upon the earth and, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Man alive. Lord, I don't know why you bother with us. <laughs> God of the second chance and the third and the fourth. <laughs> We all need it. Corrupt. Somebody read Psalm 14, verse 1. God hath said in his heart, there is no God. There are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that do good. What a verse. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. You know, all these these leading so-called atheists and evolutionists. The Hawking, the Dawking. <laughs> Hawking, Dawking. <laughs> and then you've got, um, what is it, Aaron Ra. All this rubbish. Matt Dillahan. All these atheists, leading atheists, debating the creationists. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. If you think we are here by accident, when you look at the design and creation of your own body you are mentally unstable you're a nut look at your hands look at your look at what your body it's unbelievable intricate detail the more precision and symmetry and laws that govern our land and it's all here by an explosion through billions of years through multiple mutations you're a nut and we're sitting here and we're reasoning we're having feelings and of excitement and sorrow and all, and you think it's all by accident and your eye and your brain, your hair. Yeah? It's incredible. Your hair, I don't like talking about hair. <laughs> but your hair grows, some of you, yeah? Grows. But your eyebrows don't keep, well, some of you may do. <laughs> but uh, but there, there are laws that govern, you know. Anyway, we could say a lot about that, but we won't. We'll move on. Matthew 6, turn there, Matthew 6. Oh yeah, no, sorry, Proverbs 25, turn this interesting one. 25, 26. A righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. Now, I've told you before, don't compromise. That's what I loved about Keith Green, no compromise. His wife wrote that book, No Compromise. Every Christian should read it. And again, I've said before, I don't agree with you know a lot of the stuff in his life, but there are certain things. And what I love about the guy's life was his passion. His passion for the lost and to serve the Lord. He wanted an honest relationship with the Lord. He wanted to get as close to the Lord as he possibly could. And she wrote a book called No Compromise. He did everything he could to get as close to the Lord Jesus as he could. He died at 28 in a plane crash. I don't know how, I don't know what you desire in life. I don't know how close you want to get to the Lord in life, in your life. But as a Christian, I want to get as close to him as I possibly can. And people can either help me in my walk or hinder me. And I have to make decisions. Some come, some go. And I have to cut people off and I bring people in. And I'm just trying to get close to the Lord. I want to work as a team. And you work with me or you go your own way. And we're a little church here. We have a little Bible study. We open our scriptures. We're not massive. You know, a few come every Friday, a few come every Sunday. And we sit and we talk about the Lord and we worship the Lord and we sing to the Lord and we try and get our lives sorted. And when we leave here, we try and do a little bit more each week. And some of you get it and some of you don't. It's hard. Matthew 6, turn there. Matthew 6. Matthew six nineteen and 20. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Stop there. 
So why do we? Why do we? What's the point in hoarding? What's the point in keeping loads of money? What's the point in trying to build up like an empire and getting the best of everything? What's the point? If you're not throwing your your money, your your strengths, your time, your energies into serving the Lord and doing what he wants you to do, you're wasting your time. You know, it's I've said before, but the judgment seat of Christ, where you Christians are going, where we are going, you know, you get judged for what you've done for the Lord. Anything you've done for the flesh and for yourself and, and for, you know, self-gratification, is nothing gets burnt up. Wood, hay, stubble gets burnt up. It's the gold, the silver and the precious stones, the ones you dig for, the ones that take effort. That's where you get rewarded for. So what you're doing with your life and what you're serving, you get nothing. Some of you get nothing because you just you get to the judgment seat of Christ and everything gets burnt up and you think, man, alive, I've just wasted my entire life where I could have served him. I remember Tozer saying, a lot of Christians will um, come to the, the judgment seat of Christ and think, you know, we could have come like kings, but instead we've come like a pauper because we've not lived for him. We've not done anything. May this be a day for all of us to, like reevaluate things in our lives and think, right, I've got to make a conscious decision. I've got to start doing more for Jesus Christ and living for him the best I can and being the best example and the best ambassador I possibly can. So when you go to work tomorrow and when you, 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 you know, you leave this place and you go, because it's hard, it's when we're together, it's ever so easy. It's ever so easy to get to church and do, you know, say the right things. How are you? Everything's fine. Yeah, having a great time. But when you get out there in the secular world and the humanistic, atheistic, evolutionary world and everything's attacking you, everything's against you, that's hard, because you're on your own then. That's tough. But may this be a day that is going to make you different. May God help you to have the strength, the courage to take a stand. Matthew six nineteen. Lay not for yourselves treasures upon earth. Think about it. Where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Rust doth corrupt. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Look at it. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What do you love? Where's your heart? What do you love? Are you too attached to things? There's lots of things in life I'd like to do. I've said this before, you know. I love animals, you know. Would you want a dog? Yeah, in some ways, yeah, it'd be lovely to have a dog. But I don't like getting attached to things. I don't like the death. I can't stand the death part of it. I'm very soft, sensitive, beautiful creature, really. I don't like death and that, so I won't have a dog. And I haven't got the time, yeah? I've got enough things in my life. What do I get attached to? There's lots of things that, you know, um, I loved sport. I was too attached to sport. God had to break me from sport, bust me up to stop me playing sport. That was a god to me in my life. I was so competitive, you wouldn't believe it. I loved it. I loved all football, badminton, judo. I loved all that stuff. Taking on somebody, challenging them. I loved it. And then God broke me, big time. Busted me up, so I wouldn't be attached to it. I learned the hard way. If I listened to him the first way, I'm sure I wouldn't have had what I had happen to me. What are you attached to? You've got to be careful getting attached to things. Things that don't really matter. You win a medal. You know, you put all this effort in to win a medal, to stand on a podium, to say, I'm the best. For what? (laughs) For what? What an arrogant thing, yeah? It's funny, isn't it? Competitiveness. And throughout the years, you know, I'm trying to learn different things and trying to see it from other people's points of view as well. And now I just want to please the Lord in my life. Turn to Matthew 7. Matthew 7, verse 17 and 18. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. You remember we looked at that sermon, the trees, you know, what Rockman did, but that was an interesting one. Trees, men as trees. And what you produce, what fruit do you produce? You know, it's a lovely time of year. I love this time of year um, when the blossom's out. Stunning. Yeah, England's a beautiful place. Don't get me wrong, I like South Africa. But um, and I like, um, you know, St. Kitts here. Yeah? And, and Romania. Well, there's another thing. No, I joke, I joke. It may have its natural beauty. Um, but I don't, um, and I've never been to Israel, as some posh people go to Israel, and things like that. Um, but I love England. I absolutely love England. I don't want to leave England. You know, this is, this, except at the rapture. <laughs> 
Um, but uh, yeah, are you coming or not? <laughs> um, but I love it. I travel and I see the blossom and I just see the beauty of the countryside and I just love it. And some trees are stunning, you know, with this, this white and this pink, but stunning. It's beautiful. Creation's amazing. And you, as people, you produce good and bad fruit. Which is it? You know, you're Christians. You should produce good fruit. We said before that in John 15, verses 1 to 3, I think it is, it talks about um, producing fruit, more fruit, much fruit. Three types. What are you doing? Fruit, more fruit, much fruit. What are you producing? What does your, your Christian life produce for the Lord? Are you producing much fruit? And if you're not, you need to sort it out. What, why, you know, you need pruning. <laughs> I don't know much about um, gardening. And, uh, but, you know, growing up with your dad who goes in the garden and things. And, and I remember him saying that um, with regarding rose bushes, yeah, you should let your enemy prune your rose bush because they cut it right back. And the more they cut it back, the more it grows and it becomes fuller and fuller and fuller. And so you prune. Sometimes you've got to prune hard. Sometimes, you, you know, we all need lessons. We all need to be taken down a peg or two, all of us. And we need lessons. And you need pruning. And it's like the potter and the clay, you know, this bit is a, So you, you've got to be malleable and you've got to be... And it's some people, get it out and put this in and... You've got to be moulded and fashioned as the Lord wants you to. And you need pruning. And the things in our life that needs to be taken out. So that we produce more fruit. So we're like one of those trees that blossoms. And people can see, man, life, you know, how come your life's like this? I, I'm a Christian, I live for the Lord, this is why. We should be a good testimony and good ambassador for the Lord. Turn to Matthew 12. We're not going to make it this morning, but it's a good start for this verse. Matthew 12, verse 33. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. You're a testimony to the Lord, an ambassador for the Lord. What are you known for? You know, if we went around the room and you had to describe yourself... What three words would you use to describe yourself? That'd be interesting. And what about if we described you, how we see you? That'd be even more interesting. How are you seen? Oh, sure, we have a uh, a reputation. People see us, perhaps don't really understand us. They hear about you, but they don't really understand you. Misunderstood. That's going to be my autobiography. <laughs> Misunderstood, I joke. Man, I was about this morning, innit? Um, but we are. You can, you can learn about somebody, but until you really get to know them. Interesting. Okay, a couple more. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 2. Look at this. For we are not as many which as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. We are not we but for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. You know my stand. My stand, I'm a King James Bible believer. If you've got a new King James, you've got a corrupted Bible. If you've got any other version Except the King James Bible, you have a corrupted Bible. If you don't understand that, you need to do some research. We've got tons of literature on it. The Bible is being, it has been preserved. And um, the problem is, what happens today is a lot of Christians, they just go with the flow. They don't fully understand it. Listen, we're all on a journey. We're all at different parts in our lives, different you know avenues and roads we've taken. But we're on this straight and narrow, trying to make it. And God has promised to preserve his word, Psalm 12, 6 and 7. You know it. We don't have to keep talking about that here. We know it. And if you haven't got a King James Bible, you need to get one. And those that listen to the CD and it goes out on the um, the website and that and YouTube, whatever it is. You know, the King James Bible is the preserved, perfect word of God without Corruption. There's no corruption in this book. You, and what amazes me is that Christians will spend hour upon hour trying to find errors in the Bible. What's that about? We talk about corrupt. You talk about underhanded. Why, why are Christians trying to spend all this time fighting against God's word? If God has promised to preserve his word, every word and every word of God is pure, where is it today? And then we go down that avenue, and you know the story about that, and we've gone down that many, many times. 
But so here, they were even trying to corrupt the word of God in Paul's day. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Paul never had Genesis to Revelation. You do. You don't have the signs and wonders because you don't need to confirm the word. Because you've got the word. From Genesis to Revelation, you've got it on your desk right now. If you've got a KJV. And so here, we've got this. They were trying to corrupt it even in Paul's day. And you know the lines of manuscripts, the two lines of manuscript, One from Antioch, one from Alexandria, which is corrupt. And the two lines that stream and what extant manuscripts there are for today and the 5,000, you know, that there are. And you know the story. You know the way that we've got our Bible, Tyndale and the martyrs. This book is bathed. This book is bathed in the blood of the martyrs. The NIV isn't. New King James isn't. There isn't one version. RSV isn't. It's only the King James that is. There's blood. This is, and it's, it's so true. From Genesis to Revelation, there's blood running through this Bible. There's a bloodline that runs through the Bible that just points to Jesus Christ. The incorruptible blood of God. Acts 20, 20, 1 Peter 1, 18. It's amazing. This book is incredible. Incredible. And if you, if you correct this book, if anybody says, well this shouldn't be here, or the, the Greek says this, or the Textus Receptus says, the Masoretic Text says, and you're trying to go against this book, then you become the final authority. It's as simple as this. You correct the book, and you become the final authority. And I don't trust you at all. But I trust this book. Anyway, I'll get off my high horse there. You know about that. 1 Timothy 6, 5. 1 Timothy 6. One Timothy six verse five, we're nearly through. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. The prosperity gospel. What a nut job bar that is. From such withdraw thyself. So gain is godliness? Because you've got lots of money and you've got nice cars and houses and you've got planes, God's blessing me. What a nut. How people follow Hagen, Copeland, Benny, nutjobbing, bonkers, all that lot. How they follow them, I do not know. I can't believe it. I can't believe that you can get so, you know, one tunnel vision following time and you don't question it. Listen, I, I was brought up in a Pentecostal church, but I questioned everything. You should speak in tongues, they said. You should fall over. And all this stuff, and I'm reading the Bible, and I'm questioning it, and nobody's answering the question. I'm thinking, this doesn't make sense. Something's not right. Okay, okay, I should speak in tongues. Okay, I'll go and speak in tongues. What do I have to do? Well, you have to go up the front and you have to wait. How long do I have to wait for? <laughs> What's that? About? You have to go to waiting meetings. Hey, listen, I'm still waiting. I've been saved 30 years, I'm still waiting. I've been to them, I've been to people, the, the conferences where they say, oh, he's an apostle. They said that Ian Green, Ian Green from the Pentecostal, he's an apostle. Huh? He must be really old, because the apostle was back in the thing. Man, he looks good for his age. What's he using? Oil of you, lay? All these, not sure how people find they don't question it. It amazes me. And do you know what? I know this sounds terrible, but you deserve what you get. If you're going to throw money and, and buy planes and Rolls Royces and big fancy jets for these mega Christian so-called stars, you, listen, you do that. You, I know people that have you know, gone broke because they've sent them money. One bloke he carried in Africa, he carried his dead son for miles and miles to throw him on the bonnet of Reinhard Bonke's car, thinking that if he touches that man, his son will rise from the dead. It's wicked. And that's why I go hard on them. It's wicked. Don't you? I've had nut jobs come here that believe in signs and wonders. One guy I told you before, he's a nut job. He comes here, and I've had the hip replacements, and he, had a, he needs a hip replacement. But he's a Smith Wigglesworth fan. I said, he's a nut. He said, no, 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 I'm waiting for my healing. Do you know what happened? He waited so long, he did that much damage to his body, that now his legs, he's had the operation, he's had a hip replacement, and his legs one, short, uh, one inch shorter than the other, because he's done so much damage, because he's waiting for a healing. You're nuts. <laughs> Don't get suckered in by all this stuff. Signs and wonders. You know, they wanted signs in the Bible. There's no sign except Jonas, he says. Don't go running after signs and wonders and tongue speak and all that stuff. You just don't read the Bible dispensation. It's as simple as that. God speaks to different people in, at different times in different ways. It's as simple as that. And what you're trying to do, you're trying to take something out of somewhere that's not directed to you. And by doing that, you're going to cause yourself problems. 
Eternal security. We have people here that have changed their mind on eternal security. Yes, you drop dead, I'm saved now, and that I'm never ever going to lose my salvation, no matter what I do. If I turn my back on the Lord and run back to the world, I'm still saved. I can do the most heinous of crimes. I can go kill and murder and do stupid stuff and mess up my life and lose my destiny, lose my family, lose everything. But I'm still saved. I'm as saved as the Apostle Paul. You may not believe that. You may not like it. And I don't, and I don't live a millionth like him. But I'm saved. And so are you if you're Christian. Oh, there's lots of, there's lots of, um, problems within the church. There's lots of, Doctrine. People keep wanting to bring stuff in. I told you before, you have your favourite authors, your pet doctrines, and you know, whether you believe in Calvinism or whether you, whatever, they bring it here. They all bring it here. I'm like a magnet to weirdos. <laughs> no, no disrespect. Um, <laughs> but, um, I've had them all here. You wouldn't believe it. I'll tell you a story, but I'm not going to. Let's finish off. Let's finish off here. Uh, 1 Timothy 6 5. 2 Timothy 3 8. 2 Timothy 3 8. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. Listen, you resist the truth, you're a corrupt mind, you reprobate concerning the faith. Don't resist the truth. Listen, submit to the book. Don't submit to me, submit to the book. Submit to God and let God speak to you through the word of God. That's it. That's it. And let God... Minister to you and take you and give you, you know, these amazing men of God that have just, like, really said, what is it? Was it Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. Here am I, Lord, use me, do what you want with me. Like playing chess, yeah? I'm just a little pawn on the board. Lord, you move me wherever you want me to go and I'll do whatever you want me to do. But Lord, you strengthen. And it's like with, with, even with our ministry, I, I, I keep saying this, Lord. There's lots, of, there's lots of things that could happen. I could be running scared, and, and I do get scared and anxious and troubled. But I said, and I said years ago to the Lord, I said, Lord, I'll, I'll take a stand, I'll, I'll do the best I can, but you, you've got to protect me, you've got to look after me, because I, I can't do it on my own, I can't do this stuff. I'm the least person you'd expect to get saved in my school, I just wouldn't, wasn't even interested in the Lord. And then the Lord saves me, and then... Things happen and doors open and you go through them and I just say, Lord, you protect me and you fight for me and I'll just keep going forward, I'll keep going forward, I'll keep, and I, I fall and I sin and I mess up and somehow the Lord gets me up and I get back on my feet and I do the same again and I upset people and maybe encourage a few and challenge a few and all, all over, you know, it's, we're just different, we're all different, we've all got different parts by, I can't do what I can without a team around me. It's not a one man show, it's nothing about that, yeah? I'm trying to get more people involved in the preaching, the teaching. Um, trying to encourage Matt and that. And I know Barry's just recently spoke. I've got a Calvinist coming here. I've invited a Calvinist to the church. <laughs> a Calvinist is coming to preach at the Oaks Church. You wouldn't believe it. I really like the guy. Really like him. I haven't seen him for 10 years, maybe more. A humble man. If he starts spewing, spewing his Calvinism here, me and him's going to have a bus stop. But at the moment, we're friends. Yeah. But if he, he, he comes, I've asked him to... And I, I thought... This is a bit funny as well. He's probably, you'll probably listen to the CD. If you do, I do apologise. Um, <laughs> but he's coming here and he's going to speak on who? John Calvin. You're joking, aren't you? He's going to speak on John Wesley. Why? Because he's not mean. <laughs> no, 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 no. But anyway, so we're going to have a bit of fun there. So when he comes. But he's coming soon. I think he's coming April, is it? May? May. We'll see what happens there. <laughs> I wonder if he knows what he's walking into. But... um. But a lovely chap, a lovely chap. Right, that'll do us. We'll pick up from the same verse, because I need to finish off, God willing, for next week. Let's pray.